campaign. Uh, it's great, uh, as always, to collaborate uh, between the JCAB and the Israel of Hollywood, where both rabbis are named Weinstock. Makes it very easy. Uh, some say we even sound alike. So uh, uh, this evening, we thought that people are very busy with their Pesach preparations. You know, for some people, it's very labor intensive uh, to get ready for Pesach and clean for Pesach and cook for Pesach. For others, it's labor intensive to pack for Pesach. So uh, regardless of uh, whether you're a cleaner or a packer, um, uh, the, the, the Pesach is a, an appropriate time for a little bit of humor uh, to ease the tension and also to add some inspiration uh, and wisdom. And uh, so we're happy to present Rabbi Reinstein, who's, uh, the, the Tommy couldn't be any better, for those of you who read the New York Post this, uh, this morning. Uh, and uh, it's uh, great to be here with you. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Rabbi Reinstein is a rabbi in Brooklyn, uh, a uh, friend and colleague whose uh, path uh, we have crossed on various issues. Uh, and now it's, sometimes in the rabbi, you talk about more serious issues, life cycle events, kashras, you know, but you know, here we get to talk about uh, some uh, more uh, light topics. I just thought that I, I couldn't resist without throwing in a couple of Seinfeld references to introduce the program. You know, we're coming up in the Seder, and uh, you know, we start off with the beginning, Kadesh Orchatz, Avadim Hayinu, Yada Yada Yada, Lashana Havad Yerushalayim. And um, I, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't notice that it's very likely that as we eat our matzah, this matzah is making me thirsty. So that's it, everybody. I'm out of here. It's a pleasure to turn it over to uh, the author of uh, the uh, Seinfeld Haggadah, Rabbi Sam Einstein. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, doing these classes over these last couple of weeks have been really fun. Uh, I'm trying something, trying some new ones that I haven't done before. Uh, because this needs to be fun for me also. And, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here with you, um, especially, you know, two esteemed colleagues. Uh, yeah, as you said, we've crossed paths before. And, uh, and this is, it's just a pleasure to be here. Um, so I thought first, I would give a little bit of an introduction of what's going on here. What am I doing? Why did I do this? Um, the, uh, the first, I guess, most obvious thing is that uh, you've seen a lot of these type of Haggadahs recently, um, these kind of, I, I think the earliest one I saw was a baseball Haggadah like 10 years ago, like a while ago. Um, and um, and I don't know, I feel like Seinfeld has a unique uh, connection um, to the Pesach story, some obvious, some less obvious. So the most obvious one I think is just its popularity. The the Haggadah story, the, the Seder story, is just so emblematic of our tradition. You know, we say it during Shema, we say it um, during Kiddush. We, uh, like, it's just such a big part and parcel of what it means to be Jewish that it's, uh, I think if you asked somebody on the street, like, what's the main Jewish story? Like, I feel like this, this is very obviously it. Um, and similarly, I, I think if you went over to people and just were like, what's the most Jewish thing that's happened in the last 50 years, um, at least in pop culture, probably the state of Israel wins out on that type of thing. Um, but the answer is almost definitely Seinfeld, right? Like um, I maybe somebody would think like Mrs. Maisel recently, just because it's more recent, but Seinfeld is just such a like touchstone of Jewish culture in the last 50 years that um, maybe, and maybe it's not like religious culture in particular, but like American Jewish culture, it's just so per like pervasive. Um, I, I do think there's a deeper level here. Um, and what I thought I would do is teach a couple of the different Torah. Um, but before I did that, uh, before I, and so one of them will be, what's the deeper message here? Um, I wanted to first show you just like what this Haggadah looks like for those that don't have it. Um, so it's, it's a Haggadah. Um, this has been the hardest thing that's uh, been trying to explain what this is because a lot of parody, a lot of these Haggadahs are fake Haggadahs, are like parody Haggadahs that are fun and exciting and like are a blast. Um, but this is a real Haggadah. Um, as uh, Rabbi Weinstock, as he was introducing me, um, you said this is going to be lighter. Um, it's going to be half lighter. Um, but if anything, I'm taking Seinfeld way too seriously and I'm taking. Um, um, making it far too like a serious thing rather than making the Torah and the Haggadah 
a less serious thing. Um, it was hard to even explain this to my wife when I came up with this idea, because uh, she's like, it's, not, it's, it's like the Seder, it's like a holy thing you're doing. Like, what are you bringing Seinfeld into it? And I kind of said, it's the other way. I'm not making the Haggadah um, a joke. I'm making Seinfeld um, fairly serious. So what's happening here, um, I tried to make it as immersive as possible. So the um, the thing that stands out most is like the artwork, the artwork throughout. Um, there's like a picture on just about every other, uh, just about every double-sided page. Um, but it tried to connect the Seinfeld stuff to the Torah stuff. So the Jewy fruits that are here are connected to the the commentary on the bottom, which compares, I'll let you think about this on your own, but it compares the fact that when the Jews left Egypt, they took all this wealth. And it seems like an odd thing. They're supposed to leave Egypt. Why are they taking all this wealth? So I was thinking how that was similar and different than when Elaine finds out her, her boyfriend, Jake Jarmel, is in the hospital and she's just about to enter the uh, movie theater. She goes and buys Juji fruits and is eating them when she gets to the hospital. And he gets all upset at her. Why do you buy Juji fruits? So I was thinking, like, I don't know. That's it's similar, right? Like the Jews are leaving Egypt and they're taking all this wealth. Like, shouldn't they be leaving? Isn't that the whole point? So obviously there's some differences. You can think about that on your own. Um, but regard uh, on top of that, I tried to put uh, things in the in the translation. Um, wanted to make as clear that it was when it was a joke because obviously I'm messing with the translation. The Hebrew is intact. Um, other than I added like what pasuk things are and quotation marks and things like that. Um, and um, even the, it's, it might be hard to see on your screen, but even the line um, breaking up the top and the bottom, it's like the base intro. It's a transliteration of the base intro um, in both the Hebrew and English actually, um, kind of like introducing the commentary. So I tried to make it as kind of pervasive a, uh, a, a Seinfeld experience as possible while still like making this feel like a real Haggadah. I feel like people are gonna actually read everything, <laughs> even if it's just reading the translation, because they're going to be looking for the jokes. And um, that's probably unique. Uh, I feel like most, uh, you know, you flip through pages eventually, you know, after it's been a couple hours of the Seder. Um, so I thought I would go into a couple of the, a couple of the, um, the Divrei Torah, unless anyone has any questions. I'm happy to answer some questions now and some questions later about um, what the process of this was, uh, about if if you have if you have anything specific about that, that uh, you probably have to unmute yourself to do that. And if not, that's fine as well. Okay, you can think about that for the end after after I do some of the delivery tour. Oh yeah, please. I'm just you know, wondering, you know, when engaging in something like this, is there anything that's copyright right or permission needed or anything like that? Hopefully, we you know for the fact that we blasted you all over Facebook isn't getting you in trouble or anything. No, no, no. So I did. By the way, I did. I did uh, message this to Jerry Seinfeld's official fan page. So. Oh, cool. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So it's it's funny. I feel like that's how I really know I'm talking to Jewish audiences because I've gotten this question every single time, and it was not something I was like. I considered it. I spoke to a couple of lawyers before I started, um, but uh, the fact that we're also law mindset is a uh, is is a thing that I feel like other authors for other books that are similar to this don't have to answer all the time. Um, but um, essentially, there are a bunch of questions here, um, but they're all answerable, um, and anyone can sue over anything. So I'm like trying not to get too much on anyone's radar because you know they can, you know, they have lawyers on retainer, I'm sure, that can just like slap something. So, but, uh, but, but I was fairly careful. So this is important for life, I feel like, um, is that there's two ways of fair use um, or two main ways of fair use um, that you're allowed to use somebody's copyright material. Um, the first is parody. That's what you usually see. Um, there was a famous Nathan for You episode, if, if you know that show, um, where he made a parody of Starbucks and they made, made an actual restaurant. Um, but like that's actually like kind of that had different problems because he was running a restaurant without, you know, like supervision over the food um, from a safety perspective. But separate from that, the like the reason why that's okay actually is because you're allowed to have a parody of something that's copyright. So another thing you can do is have commentary 
or something that's copyrighted in, um, which is why if you think about like all the YouTubers that like show some video from some show and then they talk about it, the reason they can do that is because they're using it for commentary. So inside the book, when I quote anything, so it's for, it's for commentary, the bigger issue was the cover, um, the, the picture that I'm actually in right now, um, is actually not the Seinfeld department from the show. Um, Rabbi Weinstock's in the Seinfeld department from the show. What I'm in is when Hulu um, starts streaming the show, they recreated the apartment and let people come and visit it. So I was able to buy that picture from Hulu and then I was able to use it. Um, and the last piece was the logo. Um, some logos aren't able to be copyright because uh, you can't like copyright a word over a shape. Like it's too simple. Like, otherwise I could just like, you know, take a circle and put like stop on it and be like, I, that's mine now. Like you can't, you can't do that. Um, and so, um, yeah, it didn't fall. It wasn't like unique enough to fall under that. So overall I was fairly careful. Um, I had to take certain things out because at first I had some like longer quotes that I thought were funny, um, but I, I took them out because I wasn't actually commenting on them. It was just like, it was funny. <laughs> Any other questions for now? I, I would just say, uh, if you have questions like in the middle of something, maybe put in the chat. Yeah, you're wa welcome to. I'm happy to answer them as they come up. Definitely at the end, and then yeah. at the end we'll right. say type of questions. Right. So the, the most obvious disconnection between Pesach and Seinfeld is the fact that Seinfeld is purportedly about nothing. Right, like that's why my Haggadah is called the Haggadah about nothing, and I got this a lot of questions. A lot of people ask me, "Does that mean your Haggadah is about nothing?" Um, but the more serious question that I actually have is: Is Seinfeld actually about nothing? So first, what I wanted to show you um, is that scene. Um, so where does that come from? Where does that idea come from um, that this show is about nothing? Um, it's if you've watched it a bunch, um, you kind of get this feel. Um, that that it is about nothing, right? Like nothing really happens. There's no, there doesn't feel seem to be meaning in it. They don't grow as characters. Like in a lot of shows, like people learn things, and even if they forget them the next episode, like they learn, like it feels like it's about something. Um, Seinfeld purportedly was not. They were not supposed to learn stuff. Um, like that was one of like the main things. Even some episodes were cut as after they were written because, like the whole point was that they're not learning anything. They don't know anything. They're supposed to be essentially bad people um, throughout all of the ninth season. Um, so where does that come from? So I wanted to share. So this is about a, a two minute clip. Um, oh, sorry, one second. I wanna make sure. No, by heart. With the sound. Um, and um, what I want you to think is, uh, uh, so just for background of this is uh, Jerry was, MB, NBC producers came over to Jerry and was like, we want, we are funny, we want you to, do a show. And what they end up doing is very like meta where they kind of pitch Seinfeld in Seinfeld. Um, and this is about a three part episode. It, it really is two, but it goes into the third um, where they are pitching the show um, to NBC. So what's happening with the TV show? You come up with anything? No, nothing. Why don't they have salsa on the table? What do you need salsa for? Salsa is now the number one condiment in America. Do you know why? Because people like to say salsa. <laughs> Excuse me, do you have any salsa? We need more salsa. Where is the salsa? No salsa. You know, it must be impossible for a Spanish person to order salsa and not get salsa. <laughs> I wanted salsa, not salsa. <laughs> so do you know the difference between salsa and salsa? You have the salsa after the salsa. <laughs> This should be the show. This is the show. What? Yes. Just talk. Yeah, right. I'm really serious. I think that's a good idea. Just talking? Well, what's the show about? It's about nothing. No story? No, forget the story. You gotta have a story. Who says you gotta have a story? Remember when we were waiting for, for that table in that Chinese restaurant that time? That could be a TV show. And who's on the show? Who are the characters? I could be a character. You? Yeah, you base a character on me. 
So on the show, there's a character named George Costanza? Yeah. What, there's something wrong with that? I'm a character. People are always saying to me, you know, you're quite a character. <laughs> and who else is on the show? Elaine could be a character. Kramer. Now, he's a character. <laughs> so everybody I know is a character on the show. Right. And it's about nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so you're saying I go into NBC and tell them I got this idea for a show about nothing. <laughs> we go into NBC. We? Since when are you a writer? What writer? We're talking about a sitcom. <laughs> you want to go with me to NBC? Yeah, I think we really got something in. What do we got? An idea. What idea? An idea for the show. I still don't know what the idea is. It's about nothing. Right. Everybody's doing something. We'll do nothing. <laughs> so we go into NBC, we tell them we got an idea for a show about nothing. Exactly. They say, what's your show about? I say nothing. There you go. I think you may have something here. <laughs> okay, so in in the in that scene, right? So that's that's what uh sorry. Um so that's what that's where that comes from, right? So it's the show about nothing, there's nothing going on. There's nothing important, and that very much feels like what the show's about. The thing is, is that just about every episode feels like it's about nothing. It's that episode that is the one episode that actually feels like it's about something, right? Because it's like a three-part episode. It's the one time where they actually kind of learn something and things go into the next episode, where they're trying to make a show, right? Like, all of a sudden, the show is about making Seinfeld. And so it kind of like hints to the fact that this show is not actually about nothing, it's about something. So what I wanted to discuss is what that's about. So what I'm gonna show is the last scene of the show. And when I mean the last scene of the show, I mean, this is how Seinfeld ends. Like when this scene is over, um, the show is over. Like there's an after credit scene that, that lasts like, you know, like, you know, a minute. It's like one of those like joke after credit scenes. But this is the end of the show, meaning like there's nothing that happens that advances anything whatsoever. This is how the show ends. And I want you to think about like, what are the, wh why is, why, how, why in the world would this be the end of a, sh of a show? It's literally the most popular show on TV. Um, maybe the pop most pop likely the most popular show ever at that point. And this is how it ends. <laughs> uh oh, I got it. It's out. Yeah, huh? Oh boy, what a relief. See, now to me, that button is in the worst possible spot. Really? Oh, yeah. The second button is the key button. It literally makes or breaks the shirt. Look at it, it's too high. It's in no man's land. Well, you were. I went to a Zoom quick. Haven't we had this conversation before? You think? I think we have. Yeah. Maybe we have. So again, th this is how the show ends. They're in jail basically for being bad people. Like everyone, one by one, the characters come up and say, this is why they did this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. They're in jail and all they talk about is like that his shirt button is a little too high. It feels like the most random thing in the world, and it is the most random thing in the world, until until you realize, and I feel like everyone that saw the finale didn't put this together because it feels like insane, but it's the only thing, it's the type of thing you feel put together when you watch this for the first time in college and you're, and you're like binging the entire thing um, that you actually notice. So if you noticed in the middle, George was like, haven't we spoken about this button question before? And the answer is they have. What I'm about to show, is the first is literally the first scene and again when i mean the first scene i mean like literally this is the beginning of the pilot this is how the show starts we're only going to show like 30 seconds of it see now to me that button's in the worst possible spot the second button literally makes or breaks the shirt look at it it's too high. It's in no man's land. You look like you live with your mother. Are you through? 
You do, of course, try on when you buy. Yes, it was purple. I liked it. I don't actually recall considering the button. Oh, you don't recall. How <laughs> come you're not doing the second show tomorrow? Well, there's this. So that That's how the show ends. The show ends, literally, the show starts. The show starts exactly with the same exact scene. And it's like the wording is like exactly the same, basically. They're talking about the same conversation. Nine years later, they're in jail for being bad people and they're having the exact same conversation they had nine years earlier. So clearly what Seinfeld is about is about four characters, really these two in particular, but all four characters are four characters that don't change at all. They have nine years, they're exactly the same people. They have the exact same conversations. They're doing exactly the same thing and they're in jail for it because they're bad people and this isn't like the life you're supposed to live, right? And somebody actually direct messaged me that, right? It seems like Seinfeld in a way shows us how not to leave our life, lead our life, right? That's exactly what it is. Seinfeld is showing us at the end, this is not what you're supposed to be. And I feel like that's actually why people hated the finale. Um, the reason why people hated the finale is because it broke with everything else. They, these, these characters were relatable for nine years and then all of a sudden they're bad, they're bad, they're bad, they're bad, they're bad, they're bad, they're bad. They're bad. And I feel like everyone that was watching it was like, wait, am, am I like that? Is that like it threw, it kind of like pulled the rug out from everyone, um, which wasn't very nice, frankly, but it like felt right with the whole thing. And specifically, I think the Haggadah is actually saying the same thing. Um, so I'm just gonna share a couple sources um, fairly quickly. But at the beginning of Magid in Halachmania, um, we just say this year we are slaves, next year we will be free people, right? The whole point of the Seder is to kind of go from being enslaved to being free. You're supposed to change. You're supposed to, whatever enslavement means for you, you're supposed to try to become a free person afterwards. You're supposed to change and be different. Um, the Gemara actually kind of talks about like, how are you supposed to change? Um, that you're supposed to start with disgrace and conclude with glory. Uh, and the Gemara argues, what, is that, what does that mean? What, what's the disgrace? So Rav argues that it's that we were idol worshippers at the beginning, and Shmuel says we were slaves. So is it that we were idol worshippers and we became God's people, or that we were slaves and became freed? But regardless, either way, right, like you're supposed to change. We're supposed to feel like we started with disgrace, but we conclude with glory. We're supposed to be different at the end. We're not supposed to be having the same conversations all over again. And Rosalvechik actually says this explicitly, um, is that the purpose of the Exodus and thereby to remember it is that it's supposed to teach ethical sensitivity what it truly means to be a Jew. It sought to transform the Jew into a Rahman, one possessing the heightened form of ethical sensitivity and responsiveness. So he's actually making an argument of what you're supposed to change. But again, right, it's supposed to transform you. The, the Seder is supposed to make you a different person than you were at the beginning. And I think what the Seder's point is that how do you become a free person? Is that you become better, is you change, is you be a different person than you were the day before. And so what Seinfeld's saying is that if you don't do that, if you don't change, you end up enslaved, you end up in jail. Um, it's a essentially the same concept, um, but like the, the opposite kind of avenue. Um, but what they're both saying is that in order to be a free person, um, you need to be reevaluating who you are. You need to change who you are. You need to become a better person over time. Um, you need to not have the same conversations you're having over and over and over again. And if you do that, you can become a Rahman. You can go to, you can praise God. Um, you can become a better person and you won't end up just like sitting in a jail cell um, with your friends, just having the same conversations you had nine years earlier. Um, so I, I think on that deepest level, um, that's why the show fits. Um, the show fits with the Seder because I really do think it's saying the same thing, um, albeit from a more ridiculous standpoint and from a funnier standpoint and all the, uh, you know, all the uh, like platitudes I can say to prove that they're not exactly the same thing, obviously. Um, but I feel like it's saying the same concept, like the same basic message is the same, um, that our Seders are supposed to transform us. We're not supposed to be the same person after Pesach. Um, that we were at the beginning, um, just like the Jewish people are not the same before Pesach um, that they are at the beginning. Um, any thoughts or questions on that from anyone?
well, I'm I'm a big fan of Seinfeld. I mean, uh, I mean that's to me is the Jewish show of the world. Yeah. But um, it's interesting that the show the show about nothing, but yet the Seder is a show about everything. Yeah. And it's interesting that what we go through the torment, especially the women and the cooking and the, the slavery of making sure like this was only, this one is happening on a Friday night and then yeah. the Shabbos and then you have to go to therapy and take Prozac and figure out the Seder. <laughs> and then you're finally sitting at the Seder. And that moment in time was your grandchildren and your children reflecting when we were slaves. But the reality is we've been going through a whole turmoil just to get to that point in time yeah. to be at that Seder to remember how we were in Mitzrayim. And that was a little bit like Seinfeld at the end. I mean, how do you end a Seinfeld like that? I mean, it's like you're, you're pulling the rug under us. It's a horrible ending, but that's the reality of it. We're going, back to, we're going back to leaving Egypt again. We're right. going back to the button. We're going right. back to that. It's oh, excellent. Right. Excellent what you did. Excellent. Yeah. And I think in there, but what's different is that when they're having the conversation, they're not reevaluating it. They're just having the conversation again. Um, um, but we're, what we're supposed to not do, right? Exactly as you're saying. It's it's um, it's supposed to be hard. It's not supposed to be something just chatting around, right? It's supposed to be difficult. Maybe not as difficult as we make it sometimes, but it's it's supposed to be difficult um, on somewhat on a purposeful level. You know, today today I lost my phone in the shul, and the rabbi, thank God, helped me. But the, the torment of losing the shul, I can imagine being in Egypt and losing right. your cell phone. You know, right. it's just uh, <laughs> it's just mind boggling what we go through just to right. have that seder, right? And and it goes from generation to generation. Definitely. I, I noticed. Uh, I remember seeing the the irony that the show's about nothing. There's no development, and yet the popularity of the show went through. A development from being just lukewarm to being one of the more po most popular shows ever. So even if the show, the characters themselves, the the creative minds behind it did have this development over time. Right, and I actually have a Torah about that later, um, where the show very much starts with disgrace and ends with glory. Um, it actually fits somewhat, like on like kind of like looking above, observing what happened. It, it very much fits. Um, with the Jewish people story kind of thing, um, where it becomes like, you know, the, the show instead of uh, just being something that lasts, you know, a season or two, 100%. Um, okay, um, so I thought I would do a couple more. Um, the next one I thought I would do somewhat of a shorter one. Um, the, the, the question, that, oh, <laughs> Is there a particular, somebody asked, is there a particular Newman style greeting that should have I love the Newman. <laughs> so, what, what I imagined in the Haggadah is that um, like a couple times throughout the Seder is that Jerry hates people that are popping people that just like, just come over without like calling first. And um, like in particular, there's one where like Elaine wants to live in the apartment, in the, in the apartment building and he, he's kind of all upset, like, wait, I don't want that. She's just going to come over all the time. So I feel like Jerry would really hate Eliyahu. Like, you know, he just like comes over. You don't know when he's coming over. He just comes on in. He didn't call before. He doesn't. Uh, so that, that, that's where I was thinking it um, in terms of the Eliyahu greeting. Um, I deal with the Newman stuff a bunch. And well, actually, um, oh, no, we're not going to discuss that this time. Um, but, but I deal with it a couple of times in terms of like, in terms of all the bad things in the Haggadah, essentially. I attribute Newman to all the bad things in the Haggadah. Um, okay, so what I wanted to, we can actually go back here. I want to show, I want to show a page. Wait. Sorry. Um, so something I, I've always thought about is, is why is, Moshe completely absent from the Haggadah. Because um, if you think about it, um, Moshe is like the character. Uh, I have a four-year-old and he actually came up with this on his own because he's been like into superheroes recently. He's like, he's, he, he was just coming over to us and he's like, is Moshe the superhero of, of the Pesach story? Like he's learning this in school and he kind of is, right? He's like the one that does all the miracles. He can do all this stuff, but he is absent from this story. And this 
um, I mean, the Hebrew text is the only time Moshe is in the in the text whatsoever, and it's in a side way. It's like not important. It's not like vital to the story. It's literally in a quote that's really about something else that they believed in God. So, any thoughts from anyone as to why why is Moshe so absent? Right, Moshe's if Moshe is the superhero of the story, like it would be like watching Avengers from a uh, from like a person's perspective and like completely wiping out the superheroes like that would feel a ridiculous movie like what is um what is going on with the Pesach story that we like completely whitewash him like he's not he's not here at all any any thoughts was that bother it um it uh, it's important that the, the the saga of the Jewish people and the story of the Jewish people, rather than just the story of the hero, that of Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay, so it would be important, right? If if so, if Moshe was in, um, then the focus is supposed to be on the Jewish people and not supposed to be on Moshe. Any other any other thoughts? Definitely on the right track. All right, that's okay. We can work with that. So what I wanted to show. Um, is there's, I don't know if anyone can think about where I'm going with this, um, but there's a character in Seinfeld that's completely absent um, from the show um, that seems like he should, of course should be in it, um, but he's just like not, and he only gets like these throw-ins similar to um, similar to Moshe where he only, he like comes in, but like he's not really there. Um, and well, who I'm talking about is Larry David. Um, so, Jerry, the, it, was, it was written by two people, mostly, um, or created by two people, um, J Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David. It's called Seinfeld. Jerry's the main character of the entire show. Um, Jerry's like everything. Meanwhile, Larry David is like enough, is like barely there. Um, he's in like 50 cameos. It depends how you count them. Um, so I wanted to show a video of what I'm talking about. Like he's there randomly very randomly um, and usually as his like his voice more more often it's his voice rather than his um covers it more often it's his voice rather than his uh his face but i'll, I'll show this is a seven minute clip of every single time he's in it we're not going to watch the whole thing um but i wanted to show like some of the times that he's there because he's like so infrequently in the show but he's there just for a second. So I just wanted to show some of it just so you get a sense of what I'm talking about. You're under arrest first of his murder, the death of Miss Chelsea Lynn. Is he wearing a cape? And that's how I did it. That's how I did it. Is this 555-8383? Uh, five, 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 eight, eight, I have no idea. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Did you steal my car? Yes, I did. Right now! That's Newman. <laughs> the, those are just some of the times. Meaning, like, it's his voice in the background. It's his, um, you know, it's his, it's his voice in the background. It's his, uh, it's his like face. Um, it's, it's him on the phone. He's, he's um, George Steinbrenner. He's like a whole bunch of people, um, but he's never important, right? He's, it's cameos. It's side projects. He's never actually a character in the show. And I was trying to figure out why. Um, so I think I found the answer. And the answer is actually in an episode of Curb. So we're going to watch a, a minute, a couple minutes of Curb, um, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is Larry David's show that came after Seinfeld. But it's appropriate because the episode is called Seinfeld because it's a reunion. It's kind of like a reunion episode. And so what's happening in the show is they try to make a reunion in, in, in Curb Your Enthusiasm. But Larry David gets into a fight with George, with, with Jason Alexander, and Jason Alexander runs off the set. So Larry David says, maybe I should try to be George. And that makes sense because the George is actually based on Larry David um, from like a practical standpoint. Um, so I want to show you that scene. And I want to ask the same question. Why is Larry David not in Seinfeld? It's like a minute clip. Let me try it. Let me do one scene. What do you got to lose? Uh, 
So I'm in the bank the other day. I'm on the line, and the guy in front of me is leaving a space in front of him. Well, you know, I can't take that. No, you can't take that. I'm thinking, come on, tighten it up, dude. Tighten it up. Right. So then, oh, are you going to do the Blackberry head down thing on me now? What, what, what is with the Blackberry people? Can I just pick up a magazine, hold it in front of your face, and read it while you're talking? Is that okay, too? Wait, what? Magazine? Hey, George. Are you happy? What? What? I want to know if you're happy. Yeah, I'm reasonably happy. You had to interfere, didn't you? George, what are you talking about? Kramer and I were all set to do this fake mugging, and you had to put all these ideas in his head that he was doing something wrong. George, wouldn't it be easier just to talk to Amanda? No. 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 Oh, George is getting upset. What do you think? Um, anyone have any thoughts as to why that did not work? How much uh, like, why doesn't it work as George? He is George, jo or George is him, really. Like, why? Why doesn't that? It doesn't work at all. Any thoughts as to why? People are embedded with George. Okay, so maybe it's just like that's it's too it's you know it's not george he just cannot be george i think it's something else so a little bit more uh, uh competition with jerry so right too it's like larry david's too much he's just too much in curb he's like the main character everything's focused on him because he's such a character he's like too intense and when he comes in, their focus is all on him. And in, in Seinfeld, the focus is never really all on George. It's like they share the, they, they, they very well share like the spotlight. Um, and that's one of the beauties of the show is that it really does share the spotlight between the four characters in a way that shows have trouble with usually. Um, and Larry David, when he comes in, he's too much. And I, what I was thinking is essentially it's what we said about Moshe. Right, if Moshe was in the Seder, he's Moshe's too much. He's just too much of a personality. He's too intense. If we Moshe was in the Seder, we'd all focus on the Seder. We wouldn't be able to focus on like the Jewish people. The focus would just shift way too much, just in the way in that scene. The focus shifts way too much to Larry David in the way that if it was George, it wouldn't have. Um, and so it's important actually to skip over Moshe um, to make him just have a cameo because if he was there we wouldn't be able to focus on him it wouldn't be it wouldn't be able to be um, so so vital um, okay uh, so I wanted to do maybe two more we'll see if we'll see if I can fit because the last one I would do is, is short um, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask a question about the Seder plate um, we whenever we talk about the Seder plate we usually talk about the things separately uh, but I wanted to ask a question, essentially, of what is the Seder plate as a whole? Um, like, what's what's something that that unites everything on the Seder plate? Um, like, we usually talk about it as a Seder plate, um, but when we talk about Mara, we talk about Mara. When we talk about Harusa, we talk about Harusa. We talk about each of the things on their own. I wanted to ask that type of question. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show an episode of Seinfeld, um, and I'm curious if you if you can think about um, what's kind of going on here. So what this is, is a, I like kind of clipped, um, there's a whole episode that's about this. I clipped it so that it's only the things that we need, um, but it's, so it's about two and a half minutes. Um, but I want you to think about how this fits in uh, with the Seder plate. So one second, sorry. Yep. Hello? What? Yeah, sure, I'll do it. I just had something canceled the same weekend. Okay, great. Bye. Yeah, you know, life is amazing. I just lost a job, and five minutes later, get another job, same weekend, same money. You know who you are? 
even Steven. What is all this? Oh, I played cards last night. Oh, yeah? How'd you do? Broke even. You always break even. Yeah, I know. Like yesterday, I lost a job, and then I got another one. And then I missed a TV show, and later on, they reran it. And then today, I missed a train, went outside, and caught a bus. It never fails. I always even out. Give me 20 bucks. What for? Just give me 20 bucks. What the hell was that? Let's see if you get the 20 bucks back. You know, you could have thrown a pencil out the window and seen if that kind of thing. A 20! Oh my god. Jerry. Yes? I've been doing a lot of thinking. Uh huh. Well, I don't think we should see each other anymore. Oh, that's okay. What? No, it's fine. No problem. I'll meet somebody else. You will. Sure. See, things always even out for me. Huh? It's fine. Anyway, it's been really nice dating you for a while. And, uh, good luck. Yeah, you too. She'll be coming round the Elaine, don't get too down. Everything will even out. See, I have two friends. You were up, he was down. Now he's up, you're down. You see how it all evens out for me? Wait, 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 that's too much. Mine was more than yours. Ah, let's call it even. Excellent, excellent. The, the reason why that's, that episode fits so well is because that actually fits with Jerry's personality. Jerry, throughout the entire show, very much is like, like he never gets too high he never gets too low he's never too sad he's never too happy like he very much is that type of character and so when everything happens that makes him even stevens right like if it, it lands very well um because this is a later episode um it lands very well because largely he is that type of character and what i wanted to do is just it's just showing a stator plate um i'm just gonna go earlier in the Haggadah, um to show just what a stator plate looks like um and if you think about each thing on the Seder plate, literally everything, every single thing is like, has really nice things about it and really sad things about it, every single thing. So some things are easier than others. So I'll do, I'll do those first. Um, the, the maror is clearly a sad thing, right? It's supposed to be bitter for the bitter times um, we had in Egypt. That's sad. Um, but the second thing on the bottom um, is the chazeret, which is explicitly supposed to kind of be bitter, right? It's supposed to, it's also maror, but it's supposed to be positive. It's supposed to, because in Aramaic, it means chasa, which is that God had mercy on us. So maror has two sides. It's one that we're sad, it's how bitter it was in Egypt, but also that God had mercy on us of how bitter it was in Egypt. The Kharo said, um, is kind of, I've heard two main explanations for this. One is that it's the, uh, the mortar, for the bricks that the Jews used in Egypt, right? That's sad. But also that it's supposed to be like a, almost like a, it's supposed to like kind of counteract the maror, that you dip it in something sweet. And that's why it's like with wine or with apples and dates, it's supposed to be sweet so that it's counteracts the maror. It's supposed to like kind of bring something sweet um, to the table. So hakaruset is also sad, but also happy. Um, parsley is a symbol of spring, right? Uh, it's Chag Aviv and uh, the spring holiday. And of course we should eat a vegetable. At the same time, we dip it in salt water, right? So it's spring and new and things that are nice um, combined with things that are sad, the tears that we had um, while leaving Egypt. Um, the shank bone is supposed to be God's strong hands um, that took us out of Egypt. At the same time, it can't be eaten. It's the symbol, this blank symbol of the Korban Pesach, of the Pesach sacrifice we don't have anymore, right? It's almost like a, uh, a very clear indication. It's like the breaking of a glass. It's like a very clear indication that the temple is not with us. Um, the egg is supposed to, on one hand, be the Korban Chagiga, the other sacrifice that we give, uh, gave on, on Pesach. But at the same time, the, and the Ramah says this explicitly, the reason the egg's on the Seder plate is because it's a symbol of mourning. 
Um, that's why I don't know if, if everyone here does this, but we um, tend to eat uh, hard boiled eggs in salt water at the beginning of the meal, right? Because it's supposed to be like a morning food that we don't have the Beit HaMikdash. We can't give the sacrifice. It's sad um, that we don't have the temple. And so everything on the Seder plate, every single thing um, is like what Jerry is in the show. It's like even Stevens where it's, it's positive and it's also negative. It's sad and happy. And the, the matzah is actually like this too. Um, where the matzah is halach manya, we talked about that before, the, um, the bread we ate while we were enslaved, but it's also the bread we took out with us as we were leaving, right? Every single thing. And I think it fits um, with Jerry's attitude at the end of that episode, is that like, we should never get too down and we should never be too happy. Um, we're good at the second one, I think, um, as a Jewish people, that, that we should never be too... Uh, too, too happy. Um, that's why we like break the class and things like that. Um, but also we find humor when things are bad, right? We do that, I think, because we've learned this lesson um, that the Seder plate represents um, that we should always be even Stevens, that we should never be too happy when things are good and we should never be too sad um, when things are bad. Um, and I think that's important uh, for us as Jewish people. Um, as we look through our history, there are times when things are really sad and times that things are really happy. And it's really important for us um, to kind of have this more balanced attitude um, that things are sad, but will be saved or things are happy, um, but we should be careful. <laughs> um, do I have time for one more? Do have time sure. for one more? Okay, so we're gonna do one more. Um, so actually I'm gonna go to a page that we, that we I mean, we did this, this page already, um, but I'll go back to it um, if I have more time for one more. Wait a second. Um, so, oh no, it is this page, right? So there, there's a, there's a quote in the. I, I quoted this before. Apologize for the same thing, but it's a separate idea. Um, that, and and we say this as part of Az Yashir, but Bayar Yisrael at the Yad Abdullah, and the Jewish people saw the great hand Asher Asa Hashem b'Mitzrayim that that Hashem did in Mitzrayim by Yeruah Amet Hashem, and the people feared God. And they believed in God and Moshe as servant. So they see God's hands and then they believe in God. It's not like an obvious thing, I think, um, if you think about that. Like, why, why do they believe in God all of a sudden? Because they see his hands, right? Like, there are times where at least the Midrash imagines that they saw God, right? Like, they saw God, the godly presence at when they got the Torah, um, when the sea split. Um, but here, what we're talking about is they saw his hands, that uh, God's hands that happened in Mitzrayim, and all of a sudden they believe in God. And, he, and like, it seems, it seems odd. It seems like an odd thing. Um, I don't know if anyone can think about where I'm going with this um, that hasn't read the Agata yet. Um, but there's a time where this happens to Seinfeld watchers. This exact thing happens to Seinfeld watchers where they see the hands of something and then they believe he exists. Um, and if you can think about it for a second, if you know your Seinfeld, um, it might it might still be hard because I this feels like a stretch, but I promise it's good. Um, the um, that this literally happens to people in the show. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a set of clips. Again, it's it's this is only a minute long, um, but a set of clips of this is every single time a character shows up. Um, and I think if you think about it. Oh, yeah. No. I think if you think about it, um, this character feels like he's part of the show. He feels like he's he's present. He's part of the show. And yet we never see his face. We never meet him and we never kind of interact with him in any way. So I'll just, it's about a minute and a half. This isn't every single time he comes up, but it's um, it's virtually all of them. In fact, it skips all the kind of inappropriate ones, which is great. <laughs> Bob Sacamano, he came in here for a hernia operation. Oh, yeah, routine surgery. Now he's sitting around in a chair by a window going, my name is Bob. She's got rabies, just like my friend Bob Sacamano. Yeah, she's delirious. She's foaming at the mouth. Well, Bob Sacamano, he stayed with me once for a year and a half. You know my friend Bob Sacamano? Friend. Well, he called last night about 3 a.m. and we got to talking. 
He sells Russian hats down at Battery Park. Forty bucks. Hey, Jer, are you going to this Bob Sacramento party? Am I going? It was three nights ago. Hey, you know, Elaine, now she stopped by. <laughs> yeah, dropped off that Bob Sacramento hat. Yeah, oh, she's uh, upset with him. Yes, sir. -y. Yeah, well, thanks for stopping by. Do you please just get on with the stupid Bob Sacamano story? Okay, well, I'm on the phone with Bob, and I realize right then and there that I need to return this pair of pants. So I'm off to the store. What happened to Bob Sacamano? Well, nothing. His part of the story is done. Oh, well, don't worry about it. I know a guy. Down here? Yeah, Bob Sacamano's father. <laughs> you know, my friend Bob Sacamano made a fortune off of those. See, he came up with the idea for the rubber band. Before that, people would just hit the ball and it would fly away. So that's not every single time Bob Sacramento comes up, but it's a lot of them. And if you think about it, we never see Bob Sacramento. We never meet him. He's not, he, we don't even see like the side of his face the way we see like the side of George Steinbrenner's face. Like he's not present ever. But I think if you ask just about any Seinfeld fan, is Bob Sacramento in Seinfeld? Everyone would say yes, right? Of course, he's a character. Right, like he's he's somebody that's part of the show. Of course he is, because um, he comes up all these times, and so I think it's something very similar. Right, we don't see Bob Sacramento, but we see his hands, or his great hand—not really great hands—but we see his hands throughout the show. Right, we see him calling Kramer, we see him calling Jerry, we see his his the hat that he gives, we see the the fake wizards that he his father gives, we see um, the invitation he invites to everyone. Like we see his existence, even though we never meet him. And I wonder if like the same thing's happening um, in this Pasuk, in this part of the Torah. Um, when, when the Jewish people see all these miracles, they don't need to see God to know that he exists. They, they feel it because like they see his hand. They see the hand and they see that things are happening. Godly things are happening. There must be somebody doing it. And I wonder if this is actually what religious people are doing till today, right? We don't have the same type of miracles, but it's seeing God's hand in the world and it's seeing the invitations and the, like the metaphorical invitations and the sable hats and the um, times we were called, right? It's seeing those metaphorical hands of God in the same way that we see the hand of Bob Sacramento. And we understand that Bob Sacramento is there, even if he's not actually part of the show. Um, so those are the ones that I was I was thinking of teaching. Happy to answer any questions. Um, I did see one. Any any question? Any connection of the four children to the four characters of Seinfeld? I had to do that, um, even if it didn't fit. I had to do that. Um, but yeah, I think it really fits really well. Um, and I I'm not going to go into it right now. Part of the reason I'm not doing it. It's my longest of our Torah in the entire book. Um, and I used some Greek philosophy of the time to try and explain to kind of re define the four sons, four children. Um, and then it really fits to the four characters of Seinfeld like really well um, and fits to a lot of four sons in TV shows um, in particular, um, like, I don't know, it, but Seinfeld, it really fits really well. Any other, uh, any other questions? I was, I was just gonna get, Rabbi Reinstein, thank you very much. Yeah. I was just gonna give a plug for your book. Oh, yeah. The unofficial Seinfeld Haggadah. I think on Amazon Prime, you could still probably get it. Yeah, definitely. So, right. uh, um, thank you again. Thank uh, you. Any questions uh, in the chat, or you can unmute yourself at this time. But thank you, uh, thank you for joining. Thank you, Jewish Center of Atlantic Beach, partnering with Young Israel of Hollywood. Uh, that's what we get to do now that my brother is at Jewish Center of Atlantic Beach. <laughs> a lot of fun. Looking forward to the next one. But uh, wishing everyone a chag kasher v'sameach. Chag kasher v'sameach. Thank you for having me. Sure.